Yo, yo. Welcome to another episode of The Houseless. My name is Peter Agostin, your host. Thank you again for tuning in to this weekly podcast. As of right now, I think it's Wednesday mornings is when I'm going to be posting these. Um, that might change. I might start doing two a week. Uh, I certainly can, um, but I do want to, you know, take my time with this thing. Uh, but I do appreciate you being here and spending your time a little bit checking this podcast out. On the show today, I have a great conversation with the one and only Fiona Bloom. Many of you in the sort of indie hip hop um, and New York City nightlife may have definitely worked with Fiona. You know, actually, come to think of it, it's not really even just hip hop. She's a completely well rounded, um, well seasoned music business um, pro at this time, at this point in time. If I have anything to say about it. Um, and absolutely an entrepreneur. We had an uh, amazing chat in a pretty unusual uh, venue. It was this um, big elementary school or middle school elementary school in Spanish Harlem um, after she had spoke on a panel. It was like a work weekend workshop thing uh, to like um, for young people that were interested in getting involved in the music business. Um, I missed that part. I came in after it was done and everyone was like eating and I walked in this room and uh, then we like went into a classroom uh, somewhere else in the building and did this little conversation that I'm about to uh, share with you. So just a little backstory on Fiona. Um, one, she's an awesome person. We had a great conversation. She's a great conversationalist, um, but she definitely has earned her stripes in the record industry, really specifically working with labels. Um, initially, having kind of cut her teeth at Chrysalis Records during the kind of uh, gangstar, uh, hard to earn period of time that that kind of time frame and then worked at uh, zero hour records so many of you might be familiar with that label too it's sort of in the matador sub pop uh, mute um, universe I I know but primarily from the few uh, releases they did with the no twist which is a, a great German a Bavarian uh, group that I like uh, but there's a pretty big catalog there, so I, I'm certain that, you know, record aficionados would know that label. And then she went on to start um, sort of two labels back-to-back. -back. One was called 321 Records um, that did some great stuff, particularly with the underground, sort of underrated Chicago hip-hop group Rubber Room, and then moved into what most people may have worked with her uh, um, through, which is uh, her sort of collaborative label um, with Big Just of Company Flow, the New York um, sort of iconic underground hip-hop hip group called Subverse Music. So Subverse made quite a bit impact like in the late 90s, early 2000s. They did like the first sort of official re-release of MF Doom's Operation Doomsday. That's kind of seminal MF Doom debut that Bobito put out on, on the you know, incredible Fondalum label, uh, they sort of did the a broader re-release of it uh, some years, a couple years after that. Also uh, reissued the KMD Black Bastards album and and uh, did uh, probably, or maybe only, almost just as known for Black Alicious's uh, sort of debut American releases post Moax. So, you know, I could go on and on sort of... Uh, in the malaise of their uh, uh, discography, but just to give you a little bit of backstory, I'm trying to give you a little bit more. I noticed in the in the previous episodes, I just sort of went right into it and then left the listener up to kind of figure it out on their own, depending on how familiar they are with the um, person I'm talking to. So anyway, 
let's go right into this conversation with me, your host, Peter Agostin, talking to Fiona Bloom here on the podcast. Check it out, y'all. All right. But nevertheless, um, I think to start, I'd love to be able to just acknowledge really where we are right now, sure. which is uh, in a classroom, oh, in nice. a sixth, I think a sixth grade classroom. Yes, it's funnily enough, it's the Tito Puente Esperanza uh, School or something in Harlem on uh, 109th, uh, yeah. between 2nd and 3rd. Yeah, amazing. East Harlem, baby. <laughs> so, what was the, um, so what was the event that you just got done? Somebody today? just asked me to speak at this Harlem uh, Entrepreneurial Summit. Cool. Um, and it was for youth, the Youth Entrepreneurial Summit. And I never say no to that because I like to right. help the youth. I mean, that's our future. And I like to share and impart my wisdom. I've done so much in this business that uh, it only helps to talk about it and share it and pass that on. And right. each one teach one, as Carolus one says, right? Right, right. What did you talk about? Like, how was the experience? I, it was great. It was fun. I mean, people love my energy, first of all. Um, I talked about social media. I talked about starting businesses, as I've started many over the years. I've been an entrepreneur my whole life because right. everyone always says, you know, how did you get into being an entrepreneur? Basically, was an entrepreneur but before we even knew the term entrepreneur, before it even became sexy to call yourself one. Because right. back in the day, people would just say, oh, basically, you're out of work. Like, mm. if you told somebody, yeah, yeah, I work for myself an entrepreneur, they're like, basically, all right, she's unemployed. Yeah. You know, but now, we'll, you know, tables have turned and, um, you know, it's very cool and very sexy and very hot right now to be an entrepreneur and be right. we met that even the uh, the young man that we met uh, when i first got here too was uh, i don't know how old he was but he seemed to already be an instant jack of all trades too. Exactly. so which is the move right now i guess oh, God, i'm guessing because yeah. right. back in the day you had to focus like find one thing and right. really hone that craft and be the best of that you can right. but now it's fine to be like good at so many different things in fact the more valuable you are is when you have those many things that you can offer. I mean, for my, you know, for example, what I do with my company, The Bloom Effect. Right. I mean, it's a suite of services. It's like a one-stop shop, you know, offering marketing and social media and PR and international consulting and booking and, you know, video promotion. I mean, it's just, it's a whole number of things. But that's Nothing. like, you've been already basically uh, doing all that stuff anyway. <laughs> yes, right? by default, exactly. Right. That's why I said I've been an entrepreneur before we knew what that term was, right. exactly. I just always worn many hats. And you were born in England, though? Yes, I'm from London, England. Right. And uh, I came to the States a couple of times. I came to the States first to pursue music as a classically trained concert pianist. I got a Whoa. full scholarship to uh, a university that's pretty impressive called the Philadelphia College of Performing Arts, wow. which is now called the University of the Arts. So I had a very arduous, very disciplined training, and I got to the level where I didn't think I was prepared to really carry it on because, you know, there's just so much that goes into it and it's less than 1%, especially in the classical world, that can actually yeah, make it. So I would think so. Basically, quit while I was ahead. I realized at the tender age of 20 that really this life of playing classical music and Prokofiev and Rachmaninoff and Chopin and Beethoven and Mozart really wasn't for me. <laughs> so, yeah. Can you still play? I, I can. Do I mean, you? It's funny, if you were to tell me, if Peter, if you were to tell me, hey, there's a piano right over there, can you right. just show us what you got? Yes, in a heartbeat, I'd go over there. And then you'd have to actually pull me away because I'd start, uh, keep playing and say, wait, I'm not finished. Yes, I still play. I don't have the chops that I used to. Right. I can't sit and play Rachman on a third. I can't sit and play Bach like I used to. But I can certainly play Porgy and Bess and Gershwin and Cole wow. Porter, Misty and all of that stuff. Incredible. So what? So growing up, when, when was that really <laughs> put onto you? To when I was it? four. So your parents were also... Um, in classical music or it was just no, a discipline to be in? No, it was just me telling my parents at that age when I first could actually speak a few words. It was like suddenly like piano, piano, because my grandparents had a piano. Mm. And when we would come over to see my grandparents for tea or for supper, right. I would just run straight to the piano. And they were like, Fiona, it's dinner time, dinner time, come on now, eat your supper. And they couldn't get me off the piano. Wow. And then one day my grandpa was like talking to my dad and said, you should start with some piano lessons. And I never looked back. Mm, incredible. Yeah. And that was four years old. Wow. And then I picked up the violin when I was seven because I was told that it's always good to have two instruments just in case. Right. Yeah. And I really took to the violin too. But then when it got to university level, they said, well, you've really got to choose one or the other. So I chose the piano. And sometimes I think to myself, not that we're supposed to have regrets, but I do look back sometimes and think to myself, 
perhaps I should not have given up the violin because violin is so much easier. You can chair any symphony orchestra anywhere in the world, right. chamber orchestras, but with the piano, you're just one sole person on that stage. There's not a lot of jobs for it. There's not a lot of recording opportunities or contracts right. or symphony opportunities where you can play a piano concerto. It's just really very slim. Mm. But hey, no regrets, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. So at what point did you, I mean, there must have been a, was it a dramatic turn from yes. being like, I'm, I, I can't be a concert it was. classical pianist anymore. I want to do this thing. Did you see Whiplash? I did see Whiplash. Everything about Whiplash happened to me in college. Really? It was basically one day where I came in and my triple thirds weren't even enough. The uh, teacher at the time, who was an incredible master, he was so, so irritated with me, so annoyed, so completely impatient that he just... I'm playing, and he just slammed the lid wow. on my hand. Whoa. I started bawling, crying. Lid came off. This little pinky finger had cracked. Oh, my God. Yes. I realized after that, I don't want to play the piano ever again. And it was, it was traumatic. That's why I say whiplash. I mean, it was really that aha, saddened, tragic... Right you know, a moment where I just said, I can't live this life anymore. Mm. Can't do it. And I was 20. Mm. And yeah, yeah, even at that age, that's got to be just so traumatic. It was was awful. And then, of course, telling my parents, explaining to them, they're in London, I'm in Philadelphia. You know, I mean, it was heartbreaking for the family. Some of my friends, you know, were so upset. Everybody was just so like, but Fiona, you had so much talent and we were voting for you and rooting for you. And it was hard. But it was so intense that I couldn't face reality. And I basically picked up my bags and took off to Israel. And thought I was going to go for three months to work on a kibbutz. And I ended up being there for two years. No way. Yeah. What did you do? I picked fruits on the trees. I cleaned uh, Hmm. hotel toilets, mitzvahs we call them. Um, I cleaned uh, kitchens. I cut onions. I did whatever they told me to. Wow. For about five shekels a week. Which back then was like seven dollars. But, you know, the beauty of a kibbutz is you get to have housing as free right. and, you know, food and everything's paid for. So, yeah, it was, <laughs> I did that for two years. I didn't actually do the kibbutz for two years. I did the kibbutz for about four months. But then I fell in love, as we all do in Israel. Mm-hmm. And I met a guy that was in the Israeli army. And he had just finished his assignment. And we just went traveling for six months. Wow. And then when I went to, Is- to Jerusalem, I found this cool club in Jerusalem. And because I had all this music background of playing... The manager of the Jerusalem club was like, well, you can help me bring the bands in. We can book bands together. No way. Yeah, so I just found myself booking a small little talent buyer for this little local club in Jerusalem. Mm. And that's sort of where I got my feet wet into, ooh, I like this party promoting and planning and bringing talent in and looking at things around the the world and seeing if they could come and play here. What was the club called? You know, I can't even remember. I think it was called, oh my God, I think it was called... Not Kadiva, but like Diver Pass or something. I can't remember, like D Y V R Pass or something Pass. That's all I remember. I can't remember. And and you would um, find bands and and, or they would already be like. How did you integrate yourself? There was like cassette cassettes would come in on the desk. We'd listen to cassettes. Um, Sometimes I'd go out and meet people on the street that would tell me about a cool artist that's doing cool things in Lebanon or Iran right. and stuff like that. And I think back then, because it was so many years ago, you could actually come to Israel because a lot of those Middle Eastern right. countries, you can't travel into Israel and vice versa. Israelis can't go to Iran or Syria. Right. Wow. What a time to be that. there too. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It was amazing. It was amazing. Yeah. And then, but you did come back. Obviously you came yes, back to the States. Not, not by, not because I was willing. It was more because my family was like, Searching for me, got the Interpol <laughs> after me, basically dragged me. Oh, they didn't, you didn't tell them where you were going after no, Philadelphia? we had no internet, we had no right. cell phones right. back then. They were really worried. I mean, it was either right. you, you sent telegrams, that was our communication, letters, or the Interpol. <laughs> wow. That's how they found me. And you, went, you were um, dragged back to London? Well, I was either dragged back to London or to Atlanta. Because my dad had taken a job in Atlanta oh, okay. in uh, landscaping. And he said, well, you can do one or two things. Go back to London or come to Atlanta and try something completely different. 
So I thought, you know what, I'll come to Atlanta because my idea was always to come to New York at some point as a musician back in the day. Like the dream was always to be in New York. So knowing that my dad was in Atlanta, I thought, well, I'm a little closer to New York than I would be coming from London. Sure. But the scary thing is, well, what do I do in Atlanta? I have no trade experience. I have no, I'm young, I'm 22, but it was like, Fiona, go back to school, study. But I had to literally pick a major because my whole background was music, music, theater, and literature. Right. I never did any science, never did any business, never did any math, didn't do any of that. Right, right. So it was kind of a hard task to go through these majors and say, well, what can I possibly do? What am I going to be, you know, eligible for? What will I have the qualifications for at this level? Right. So guess what I chose? Um, is it communications? Hey, you're good, <laughs> Peter. You're smart. Right. Speech communications. Ah, there you go. Because I figured, well, I have the gift of gab. Speech, I think I can speak. I have a good talk. Right. I have my story together, I think, and it can change over time and adapt. And then communications, yeah, I like to speak to people and I'm a good communicator and I think this makes sense. <laughs> so what, so then you, but I know that you did radio. Did you, I did. was that a, almost an immediate thing or did yes, you just like stumble into the? <laughs> it was so immediate. I went, I enrolled at Georgia State University, right. which is in downtown Atlanta. Yeah. And I noticed that they had the largest, most powerful college station in the country. Wow. And the reason being powerful was because it was a hundred thousand watts. That's a lot. It wasn't 40 watts. It wasn't 20. It wasn't 90. It wasn't a hundred. It was a hundred thousand. Which meant that you could be heard in Savannah, you could be heard in Macon, you could be heard in Athens, Georgia. Like Incredible. Much. Yeah. Right. So I just walked in there. Really? I, it was 88.5. That right. was the FM dial. And they had a show called The Best of Britain. Mm, and I was okay. listening to this show thinking, how are these DJs with American accents doing a show called The Best of Britain? Right. So I walked in there all bold and, you know, semi-abrasive, but kind of assured of myself, confident. So, hello here, you know, with the best British accent, because of course back then it wasn't as faded as it is now. I've right. been living here a long time, so you assimilate. Of Still course. got the accent, but it's, it's diluted a bit. <laughs> Came in with a very thick English accent and said, So, who are the blokes that are doing this Best of Britain show? I want to meet them. <laughs> and one of the guys was like, uh, I happen to be one of them over here. What's up? Hey, would you like a co host, like from. London, because that's where I'm from, that actually knows the punk scene inside and out, that actually knows right. the mod con and 80s era and all of that stuff. And they were like, hell yeah, <laughs> come on, come right. do it. So I was just kind of like guest co-host. Next thing you know, like the dial was ringing and, you know, phones were going off the hook. Wow. And they said, well, I think you should co-host the show. And then from there, I had my own show. I started doing a jazz show and then started getting on more often uh, on the weekly, you know, like a Wednesday, a Saturday, a Sunday. People just, just working your way up the week. my right. name, like right. Fiona B. Who's that girl? We want her back on the airways. Where is she? So I would fill in where I could. I really fancied this kind of talk show, radio personality, you know, DJ thing. You have the like, voice for it. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking, this is natural. I could do this all day long. Wow. Yeah. Right. And because it was 100,000 watts, I got recruited to commercial radio. Really? Oh, so I, I then found my way into Star 94, 94.1. And yes, yeah, started learning the real ropes from there and got as, actually a position as an assistant music director for Star 94. Which was so that's amazing. just commercial radio. I'm not familiar yeah. with the station, but that's a Atlanta-based commercial Atlanta radio. commercial radio. Right. And at the time, uh, Atlanta was a top 12 market. Right. Which is huge. Right. It's not like Indiana, Bloomington, or Milwaukee. It was right. actually really well considered, uh, and the sort of a playground and the stepping stones for really laying the foundation for really excelling in the radio business. Right. Were which you? I didn't know what I wanted to do. I just walked into it. Sure. And then obviously you kind of once you get a knack of it, because I because I got my start in radio as well. Mm. Um, uh, you start to see those Gavin magazines and hits <laughs> right. and CMJ. Album Network, right. Hard Report, Urban Network, exactly, yeah. So do, is that, do you think that's maybe how you familiarize yourself with the record industry as far as labels and stuff? No. Are you communicating with labels? Or? Actually, funnily, great question. No, I had really? no desire. All I wanted at that point was to be a personality. Right. To be an MC, introduce bands on stage, to be a talk show host, because I realized, oh, Carl, I've got a knack for this. Okay, talk show host, comedian. Mm. At that point, I wanted to be a comedian because I knew I was funny. People said I cracked them up. I cracked myself up, my family, my friends. They said that I had this gift that I could just, if I pursued it, could actually 
be on stage, do stand up and do it well. Did you did you try that at all? Not really, but I did keep pursuing the talk show stuff. You know, did odds and ends with some video outlets that were like, uh, you know, small left of center, you know, alternative video outlets. There's Georgia State had a video um, station, TV station. So I did a couple things here and there mm. with that. Never thought about the record industry. Yes, of course, the Gavin report fell on my lap and I would skim through the pages but not to find out what labels were putting it out, more so what new bands are on the charts. Right. Never really looked at, oh, was it Arista, Polydor, was it Columbia, was it, you know, Beggars, whatever it was. Right. I never really looked at that, Electra. Um, so no. And the reason I fell into the record industry is, is because I was doing this, you know, thing so well, got a name for myself as a radio personality, and record companies would come in, promotional people would come in that did, you know, promotions department, handing me free tickets, you know, box sets, tickets, CDs, dinners with the band, interviews, like all these amazing things. Uh, I didn't necessarily care that they're coming from Chrysalis or, you know, EMI or, you know, Sony. I didn't really care who they were at the promotional level. I just cared about who the bands were, wanted to meet the bands, wanted to hang out with the bands, wanted to promote, wanted to do right. parties. That's what I wanted to do. Be a party uh, promoter and be a DJ and an announcer and host, etc. But what happened is a guy that was an EMI SBK president in New York at the time called Daniel Gloss. Mm. He would come down to Atlanta a lot because at the time he just signed Arrested Development. Right. He signed Joy. He signed Dallas Austin, the producer. Of course. Follow for now. So he had quite a few Atlanta bands and I was friendly with all of them. Right. So he would just kind of watch me navigate the room and all these people know me and he was just kind of... Daniel Gloss was just kind of fascinated with me kind of mingling with all these people. I guess he saw me as the white female Jew, right? British British white female Jew navigating this urban landscape and right. doing it so well. And he was like, he was just like enamored by it. And so he took me to the side one day and he said to me, I've been watching you. I love your energy. I love your style. You seem to know everybody here. Everybody really appreciates what you're doing. You've got this knack. I can't explain it, but I think you would do really well in New York. Would you like to come to New York and work for us. Wow. My first response was like, who's us? <laughs> Who are you? Right. And he's like, I, and he loved that actually. He loved the naivety. He loved the fact that I didn't know about the record business. He's like, uh, I'm Daniel Glass, president of uh, Chrysalis SBK EMI Records. I'm like, oh, okay. I didn't, I was like, oh, okay. And he's like, how would you like to come to New York and work for us? You'll be with the bands, you'll get to learn the marketing and the promotion, you'll be with a great team of people, you'll make some good money, because right. I'm sure you're not making a whole lot of money here, are you? And money never really drove me, but New York did. So I was like, yes, I want that job. I don't really know the record business, but damn it, I'm going to learn it. Right. So literally I went in through on the deep end, you know, through, thrown into the sharks. But let me tell you something, Peter, that job didn't come that easily. Right. It wasn't like, okay, Daniel Glass flies back to New York, call him come up and you've got the job. Yeah, they set everything up for you. It took me three months to get him on the phone. Really? I didn't even get him on the phone. I had his assistant finally take my call. Mm. And finally, through being so relentless, being so persistent, finally was able to get an interview, paid my way. I had to pay for my own airfare. It's not like anybody handed me a ticket. I had friends I could stay with, so that was good. Paid for the air ticket, ended up doing an interview, got there at 9.30 in the morning, left EMI building, 1290 Avenue of the Americas, I remember it so vividly, wow. left that building at 6.15 p.m. So it was like wow. nine hours of meeting everyone from the top to the mailroom. And I didn't even know how it went. I was like, I couldn't even tell you I had the job. I couldn't even walk away from there knowing confidently like, yeah, it's mine. It was more like, I'm overwhelmed. I'm exhausted. I haven't eaten. Well, I kind of ate, but not really. Right. Um, you know when you speak all day long, your throat is really dry? Sure. That's how I felt. I went to bed that night in New York feeling like, I don't know what's going to happen to me. Am I going to get this job? Am I not? If I do, do I move? Do I stay? Should I stay or should I go? Clash. <laughs> and go back to Atlanta. Didn't get a phone call for three weeks. Called them. They said, we don't have an answer. We don't know. Just chill. Somebody will call you. Don't worry. If you're going to get the job, you'll know. Three weeks later on the phone. Hi, this is so-and-so EMI Records. Just want to let you know we're offering you blah, blah, blah. National Marketing Manager, come to New York, start January 2nd. And this date was December the 18th, wow. right before everything was shutting down for sure. Christmas. I was like, ah, screaming. And they were like, ah. 
I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to deafen you. So sorry. I was so freaking excited. I didn't even ask him how much I was going to make. That's how excited I was. Yeah. But basically, at the end of the phone call, they did say to me, this is going to be your salary. Hope you're okay with that. I was like, yes, I'll be there. Can't wait. And so I had literally five days to tell my land of Atlanta, which right. I had a great circle of people. I was I well think- known. I had five days to tell everybody there that I'm leaving. So I threw the most amazing goodbye party. Oh, my God. I had the mayor of Atlanta there. Wow. Bill Campbell. Okay. At the time. I had Outcast, who was just coming up with Players Ball from Southern Playeristic Cadillac Music. They performed at my goodbye party. Wow. Escape performed at my goodbye wow. party. Dallas Austin hosted it. Uh, some of the TLC crew were there. Pebbles was right. there. Right. Um, little John was my DJ. What? That little John yeah. was my DJ. Organized noise, the whole crew, the entire urban community, La Face, they were all there. Incredible. To me off. Just Jazz, that was the name of the club. I made Peach Buzz, which is the cool gossip column of the Atlanta Journal Constitution. So much press, and people to this day still remember December the 20th, Just Jazz 1993. Incredible. Yeah, because this was right as Outcast was breaking. I'd say, Escape yeah. Escape had already had a couple hits. I think even Damien Dame was performing. Pebbles, like I said, Ellie Reed, all right. these people, Bryant Reed, LA, they were all there. Incredible. What a send off. And then uh, and then what's it like, you know, at the top of nineteen ninety four when you get to New York? Is, oh it, my is God. it a total my, shock or Yes, my office was on the thirty fifth floor. I'll okay. never forget my first visitor, Dallas Austin. Dallas Austin was like, Yo, so is it cool to come up and see you? I was like, of course. So you were the in almost, uh, a, a, an in into the New York scene for some of those guys. Uh, obviously, Dallas artists. Austin was established down there. He was definitely well. established, yeah. But some of these other artists, like Joy. Right. You know, Rest of Development was established. Speech definitely was very established. Sure. But all the others weren't yet. No. Yeah, because the Rest of Development's album had come out by that time too, right? 90, yeah. 92 or 3 or something. Yeah, I think the first one came out uh, in 1991. Then right. the really big one was 93 and Tennessee. I think Tennessee. Tennessee came out in 93 and right. that stuff. Everyday People, I think that was 1992, 93. So yeah. the rest of the album was the most famous out of the crew. Sure. Yes. Yeah. yes. But wow. I'll never forget Dallas coming in and like, he was so shy. He's like, walked his head in. He's like, yo. He's like, you've got windows all the way around. He's like, you've got video screens. He's like, wow. Like, yo, you got it going on. <laughs> <laughs> that, was like, that was pretty amazing. It is amazing. Where were you living at that time in New York? I had sublet a friend's place on the uh, Upper West Side, 79th Street and West End Avenue. Nice. Only because I had like five days to find a place. Sure. So luckily a friend of mine was just moving and she said, I can sublet my place to you. And that's where I was staying for about eight months until I got another place with roommates. So, and you've been in New York the whole time since Yeah, then, I never right? looked Incredible. back since January the 2nd, 1994 to 2016, September the 17th. I have not looked back. Wow. Yeah. Well, I can remember one time visiting you in, in one of your offices in New York. Yeah, and I think probably. In su- whichever was on Canal Street. Yeah, which was, late. It was Late Street. It was in Tribeca. Right, right. Yep. Yeah. Yep. That must have been. a very old industrial building. Right. Which we also had hooked. Hooked.com. Remember the internet uh, company oh, at the time? Yeah, they shared offices with us. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, obviously, a lot happened between uh, yes, you lot. know the chrysalis days yes. and subverse yes I mean, a lot yes. so how long were you doing the major label thing the marketing thing like what? I was at EMI for a little shy of a year okay which is nothing so almost a flash in the pan a flash whatever. in the pan and to the point where people just expected me to come home people were just like alright so you're going to be back in Atlanta right back right. on the air back on your hustle back doing radio and promotion and party right. running but I was like determined I'm still young. I'm 24, 25. I'm ready to go. Right. Just had a major job at a major label. I'm like, hell, I'm not coming back, especially after that send off. Right. How can you come back after that huge party? No. <laughs> so I was like, I am determined to make it. But the thing is, after just a year, it's like I didn't have a lot of connections. Like, what do you do in that year? I didn't, not many people knew me in sure. New York. I didn't really form a reputation yet or establish myself. So it was like, okay, I had to do a little bit of temp work. Okay. But then, very, very luckily, I was just unemployed for six weeks, which is kind of amazing to know that I could go in just six weeks to another record company. Pretty amazing. Yeah. It was like the second interview that I had. And the way that I knew about this company was it was a startup. It was an independent label. It wasn't, wasn't, no other major was going to hire me, let's face it. Right. That was sort of, we, word got out that was a fluke. Right. I got that job. It was a fluke. I had no prior record business experience. Obviously, if I'm being let go in a year, it doesn't show that... 
Not that it was my thought I was let go, but, you know, being let go is basically being fired, right? Sure. So other major labels see that. No major labels rushing or standing in line to bring me on board to work with them at Sony or right. work with them at Polygram. Or, you know what I mean? Because you working at Crystalis, I mean, uh, was it that you had any... I, mean, I got Gangstar. That's what I was about to ask. I was marketing people for hard to earn. Oh, my God. And I got to be so friendly with... Keith, Guru, rest in peace. You know, I mean, really, we had a great rapport. I was also responsible for John Cicada, some of the marketing, Diggable Planets. Yeah. Because we also had Pendulum. That's so I right. Did marketing for so Pendulum. that was also like Soul Lords Sonics, of the Underground, Lords I think. Lords of the so. Underground, exactly, yeah. But obviously, Gangstar was the, you know, the, the crown Mass jewel. Appeal, but... Wow. I remember to this day hearing Mass Appeal for the first time in our large conference room wow. with all the big suit and ties and... You know, the head nodding people that were in the hip hop urban department, and me included, right. and in the suit and ties, not knowing what to do or trying to be like, is this a hit? Is it a hit? What does it mean? What is this mass appeal? And trying to bop their head, but completely off time. Right. It was a great, I still had that visual That's vividly amazing. in my mind. Yeah. yeah. But so six weeks after I lost my job, yes, I was very fortunate. Um, Mike Stuto, love him dearly. He owned a rock and roll club on Avenue A called Brownies. Of course. Yeah. Really hot. You look too young to know Brownies. Right? I know the club. I, I didn't, I wasn't living in New York yeah. at the time. But, yeah. Uh, he had heard. I'm not that young though. <laughs> he, he, I don't know how he knew me, but he'd heard of me somehow from the EMI right. days. And he knew that uh, Ray McKenzie at the time, who started an independent label called Zero Hour Records. Right. He knew that Ray McKenzie, Zero Hour startup company, was looking for a publicist. Hmm. So he told Ray about me, and then Mike found me and said, would this be something you'd be interested in interviewing for? I said, yeah, because I didn't have any other interviews other than temp work, right? right? So I walked into the office with Ray. I'd never done any PR. Just think about it. I'd done my own PR, radio personality, concert pianist, promotion, party planner, party promoter, marketing guru at EMI, but that wasn't true PR, right? I mean, I, so I dealt with publicists, but right. I wasn't a publicist myself. So I took the talk, the gift of gab, walked the walk and said, that's my job. I own that job. I can start PR from the ground up, put your artists on the map, build your roster from the beginning, lay the foundation and make you one of the most exciting independent labels on the planet. Wow. And he believed it. He took a chance because you have to do that in this business. He took a risk. Right. He brought me on. Now, of course, half the salary that I made at EMI, because again, he was a startup. So I think at EMI I was making like 60,000. I think he started me at 26,000, 24, yeah. 25. That'll happen, right? But hey, guess what? I took it and I was excited and I was like a kid in a candy store saying, I'm going to make this happen. And guess what? I put zero hour on the map and on the tongues of every major label in the business. Well, I love the No Twist, which is a band that was on that too. And um, I met those guys a couple times and yeah. super cool guys, incredible yeah, musicians. Yeah. And I know, see, because when I was even just doing some baseline research before I talked to you, mm. I wasn't too hip to that label. So, and then when I saw uh, that they had done, I think pretty much some of their very first stuff came out through that Absolutely, too. Absolutely, yeah. What yeah, yeah. do you have any? Do you remember working with them at all, or, yes. or did you work those that record? Yes, or? yes, yes. They were so sweet. First of all, they didn't really speak any English because right. they're from Bavaria. Um, but my first impressions of them, super cool. You know when you call that rock stuff shoegazing, where they're just like playing so hard, but there's just not a whole lot of interaction in the audience. Right. But you know that you're witnessing something so frigging cool. Well, we had signed them, but I'd never seen them perform yet. The label was zero hour. I'd never seen them perform. But we knew that we were signing something great. Because yeah. at the time, my boss had a really, I don't want to see in, say inferiority complex, but we felt like we were in the... Zero Hour felt like we were very much the bastard stepchild in the sense that we were trying to be sub-pop, trying to be matador, matador. But they were killing us, blowing us away. So we knew that when we did something like a no twist, right. Matted or Sub Pop would be paying attention. Right. And it certainly did work. So <laughs> I'll never forget the venue at the time in New York so hard. I saw so many amazing bands there, hip hop and rock, called Tramps. Yes, that I've been to. They did a show at Tramps. That was like their first introduction to nice. the US. And I looked at the whole crowd. Everybody was mesmerized. Everybody was just like in a trance. It was just like at the end of the at the end of the songs, yeah, they'd be like, yeah, screaming like you rock, but like silence in between their songs because we were just so afraid we'd miss 
a mm. nuance or right. a sound or a musicality tone that we were going to not, you know, forget ourselves for otherwise. Right. It was magic. I'll never forget that night. And I was so honored and so privileged to know that I was working a project and, a, and an album and a band that were just so damn good. Right. And what was beautiful about it was being a publicist. It was like a publicist's wet dream. I got them in Rolling Stone. I got them in the New York Times. Nice. I got them into Entertainment Weekly. I got them in Newsweek. I got them in Spin. I got them in Alternative Press. Every single magazine you could imagine at the time. And we're talking print. This is right. pre-internet. Every single magazine and newspaper, LA Times, Wall Street Journal, I pretty much landed for them. Incredible. So we call it critically acclaimed. Right. Because it's not like we were selling loads of albums. We did pretty well as an independent. Sure. But the critical acclaim was en masse. It was right. just amazing. And that still resonates today for that band because they can still play big rooms in, in, in America and in yeah. Europe too. So. Yeah. Yeah. So obviously you're getting, a, uh, you know, to go from a, you know, a major label essentially to a total indie situation. I mean, Unfamiliar how many... Unfamiliar land, right. landscape, because I'd never done PR How many before. people were working in that office with you? Right. So at EMI, we had probably about 120. And then in the independent zero hour label, we had nine, ten. Okay. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. When I started, so, I think I was the ninth person. Huge jump to, uh, yes. you know, yes. very yes. intimate. But I preferred it. Right. I have to tell you, I was shitting bricks every time I went to EMI. Every time I would take that train from 79th Street to, you know, Rockefeller to, 50, to um, 51st and 6th Avenue, my, I felt like this gut, like this pit, like the stone in my pit of my stomach. Wow. Nervous, just so nervous because it's intimidating. But when I came to Zero Hour every day, I just felt so excited and so happy and I'd stay work all night sometimes because right. I was just, I felt like I was in my element, you know, like I was so hands on every single thing that you did, every step of the way you got to see it build and see the rewards and the fruition of your hard work just, just right in front of you. It was just so great. Yeah. It's amazing how that contrast really exists where you can go from being, um, you know, overwhelmed, intimidated to being completely in control yeah. and inspired yeah, and yeah, motivated. Yeah. And comfortable. Right. Comfortable. I mean, they always say it's good to go out of, outside your comfort zone. Sure. Well, I did go out of my, outside my comfort zone because taking that job as a publicist, I, I was never, I never wrote a press release. Right. I'd never pitched writers and journalists and, you know. And, so and how do you learn on the fly? I, how do you learn on the fly? Doing I something? just thrust myself full in had a database to work with and built that database from what I had existed right. to creating more. Got out in the scene, went to conferences like South by Southwest, New Music Seminar at the time, CMJ. Because the good thing is my boss let me travel. My boss let me go to every conference, mid cool. Popcom. And it was great going to Popcom at the time because that was in Germany. At the time that was in Cologne and we had done quite well with the No Twist. Sure. So when I went to Popcom for the first time, it was great because the No Twist basically held my hand everywhere and introduced me as the publicist. And all of a sudden, I got open arms and welcoming and all that stuff because, you know, you had an in being working with a very cool right. band from part it Germany, you know. So, so this is what, 95 now? This or is 95, 96. Wow. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And then, but then how, what's the shelf life of that label too? Because that label wasn't around for too long. <laughs> That's right? a long story. That label could still be around today had they right. not have made certain moves. I won't go into all the politics. Okay. But basically, uh, Daniel Gloss came back into the story, back into the picture, because right. I stayed in touch with Daniel Gloss. And at the time, he just started a company called Rising Tide, which he and his partner, Doug Morris, at the time, who Doug Morris now is, what, head of Universal? Or yeah. Major, I mean, he was major back then, but he's even more major now. So Doug and Daniel started Rising Tide, and I knew what they were doing, because I was reading Billboard and Gavin and reading the news, and didn't really have the... Internet was just starting to come into play, but not really. Right. Because this is now 1998. Yeah, you're still relying on the print trades. Exactly. The right. trades, print, radio to get your source, right. you know, your information, television, MTV. Sure. You know, 120 Minutes, Matt Penfield, you know, that kind of stuff. Right. Huh? So um, I'd heard that Daniel Glass had started this company. I heard he was looking for talent, that he was looking for music, looking for what well, we call it content now, but looking right. for... I don't know what's worse, product, which is what we called it back then, or content. I don't like either, really. Yeah. But, you know, looking for music, looking for bands. So I called up Daniel. I was like, because we were state, we were friends. I called up Daniel. I said, Daniel, 
you need to come and see what we're doing at Zero Hour. He's like, really? And he trusted me. So he came over to Zero Hour. He and my boss had a long chat. Next thing you know, he brought in Doug Morris. They had a closed door meeting, six hours. At the end of it, handshake, major contract, huge deal, Zero Hour slash Rising Tide. Wow. Multi-million dollar deal, which I got a $7,000 bonus. Oh my God. Had I been more business savvy, right. should have gotten about $50,000 from that. Right. Deal because I... Well, you brought them together. I brought them together. Right. Exactly. Right. But you know, I was still wet behind the ears, even then, even though I'm in my mid-20s, sure. I'm sure. still wet behind the ears. I'm still very much not a business person. I was a musician. I'm a promoter. I'm a, you know magic you know i create magic whatever that is you know right. so i business was terrible i was so bad at business so bad at business so you know you get screwed but that's the way you learn right you just get screwed so anyway yes. we had this rising tide situation got a seven thousand dollar bonus and my boss said to me fiona you are amazing you're a gold mine you are so invaluable i just want to honor how much you mean to our company how much you mean to me i will give you whatever you want what do you want, Fiona? So rather than say $100,000 salary, I said, I want to start my own label. He <laughs> goes, do it. He goes, you know what you want to call it? I said, three, two, one. Right. That's great. I like that idea. Because zero hour. Three, two, one, zero hour. Yeah, there you go. And the first band I signed was Black Alicious. Mm. But I put out a compilation first, which I'm sure you remember Connected, called Connected, right. yes. which got great critical acclaim, tons of critical acclaim, because I'm a publicist. I knew how to reach the sure. uh, journalists and the editors and the magazines and the radio. And so 321 suddenly got way, way, way tons of attention and almost more attention than Zero Hour. Right. And then next thing you know, we were selling way more records than Zero Hour, vinyl, CDs, couldn't keep them on the shelves. Now this is under the banner. Are they? Is it all under one? It's under three two one slash zero hour, right. which at the time was distributed by, I want to say either R E D or A D A. Okay. I think it was A D A. It's one of the two. Right. But um, you know they given us some seed money for three two one, um, and then of course was funded by Rising Tide still. So we had all the money in the world. So I could go to Black Alicious and say, listen, not that Black Alicious had any bargaining power back then because was, this was Black Alicious in 1998. They right. had barely been discovered. DJ Shadow, Soul, they had a little label called Soul Side. This sure. is pre Quantum, and they were just working out of Oakland, California. DJ Shadow had taken it to um, the Mowax. UK label Moax. So they had a lot more credibility in the UK. Right. But they weren't huge sellers. They just had critical acclaim and a nice buzz in the UK and some parts of Europe, but no buzz in America. Right. None. Nobody wanted to sign them. How did them. you find them? Like, how did you engage with them like that? To the point of wanting I, to sign them as yeah, like the first yeah, 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 yeah. So I put, they wrote that, I put them on the compilation. Right, yep. I think it was Reach the Stars or Touch the Stars. Um, and on that compilation was also Latif, who was also part of the That's right. crew. That's right, Because I was so in tune to hip-hop from the days of doing hip-hop, from also being at EMI with hip-hop, I just read the Gavin Report. So I would read CMJs, I would read the Billboard, or I would go to record stores. Right. Because I was traveling with Zero Hour San Francisco, you know, going to some of these trade conferences, I'd also right. go to all the record stores. Sure. And I'd go through all the crates of vinyl, and I kept seeing, in California, Black Alicious, little Black Alicious 12-inch this, 12-inch that. Take it home and play it and say, holy shit, these guys are dope. Gift of Gab, Excel, like it's just a two, it's just two of them, they're right. dope. So I put them out on the compilation, Everybody, I think you included, all the writers right. highlighted those tracks. Like some tracks got more highlighted than others. Yeah, they were def de definitely highlights, absolutely. For definitely sure. highlights. And they, we had a great rapport. And they, they were like, we're getting more attention from this one track on this connected 3 to one compilation than we have ever had on Soul Sides, Moax, like any of this. So that already kind of put a notion in their mind. Right. And then we got on the phone because I don't think we had well no we had mobile phones but we didn't have the internet per se this wasn't over email we got on right. phone and we chatted and i was like i'd love to sign you guys like i i can do whatever i want here i i have budgets like my boss ray mckenzie thank you so much he gave me that great break i have money i could maybe pay you fifty thousand dollars to incredible 
sign or license an EP or do something, and which is more than any other label of hip hop that back then was doing. Sure. So um, I went. I'll never forget. I went to Oakland, California. They were recording out of Pajama Studios. That their, was their home base. Okay. And I met them there. It was great. We just laughed all night. We listened to music, listened to right. beats, listened to the flow. Gift of Gab was dropping all kinds of gems. I wish I had social media back then because I would have been, you know, right. Facebook living it. I would have been having a Snapchat session with them. I would have been doing a live stream on YouTube. I would be all over Instagram with me and them hanging out in Oakland, California. There was no social back then, right? So nothing to capture it except my head, my memories, right. and the word that you believe and trust that I'm being real and honest and authentic and not embellishing. This is all true facts. This is all facts. So we just had the great rapport. I came back to New York and I said to Ray McKenzie, Zero Hour, I said, listen, you saw how great this new track did on Connected. And the Connected album, by the way, sold about 75,000 compilations. Wow. We sold about 20,000 vinyl. And I think that was just in the US. I think worldwide, probably about 150,000. Incredible. So again, we're blowing Zero Hour out the water because Zero Hour is not selling so well. I mean, we had some good acts, Space Needle, Swerve Driver, The No Twist, Varnaline, but then some of the other acts weren't as good. And we yeah. weren't, you know... And, and hip-hop, at that time, people, was, the hip-hop consumers were buying everything. 1998, 97, 98, 99, yeah. Golden Era, still yeah. the Golden Era very much. Fat Beats was killing it. You know, the, the record store was Fat Beats, you know, uh, distribution companies were just right. going crazy, yes. And so uh, my boss was like, all right, let's do it. What do you think they'll go for? And I got him on the phone and I said, "Would you would you do a record for us for fifty thousand? And you know, Excel, I got to hand it to him. He's quite a businessman because he was like, "That's low." And I was like, "Are you out of your mind? Nobody's gonna. Can I say the f word on this? Sure. Nobody the fuck. Nobody is gonna. I don't care what the fuck you think, Excel, but nobody's gonna sign you for more than fifty G's. In fact, I don't even think someone is gonna offer you twenty five G's." So we talked about it, we agreed, right. but what we decided on was 50G for the EP, which was the A to G, A to G in Cut Chemist remix. Right. And then depending on how that went, we put out Nia and give them another 50,000. I think that was the agreement. Okay. Well, A to G was selling like hotcakes. It's an incredible record. We were probably selling like five to 6,000 a week for an indie, which is like, Unheard of. Right. I mean, Raucous was doing that, but right. no other companies. I don't think Stone's Throw at that point was doing it. I don't think Ubiquity or, um, you know, that other label that had people on the st people under the stairs. Ohm Records? Ohm. Right. No, I think the only other company that was doing that was, because this is before Def Jocks. Right. I think the only other company doing that was Raucous. We really had something, really had something, and those days Peter I'm going to start crying <laughs> um, so yeah we killed it with A to G and then yes we renegotiated for Nia and gave them more money but here's the sad part all great stories have all happy stories come to sad endings or all good things must come to an end kind of thing that's for sure so what happened was um, I had just signed Rubber Room I yep. went on a signing spree. So we had Science Alive, we had Rubber Room, which had just started taking off. We had the Black Alicious Nia that had just, we just put out and it was right. going mad, crazy. So much press, so much, even CMJ, like top 10. I mean, it was incredible. Um, South, South by Southwest calling me, you know, let's do showcases with them. I mean, it was amazing. We were really, really sore. People, after. when, yeah, when, when that, that EP and then Nia, that period of time for Black Alicious, like everyone, rally behind them yes. it, was there, it was incredible production it was yes. just, yeah very well made music for sure and at that time I had also signed a 12 inch uh, double A side with Pumpkinhead Word of Mouth Nonfiction and The Arsonists mm. surely you remember that record it was called Scheme Team I do uh, Plan A and that was just a 12 inch CD single and vinyl we must have sold 50,000 vinyl at least for wow. that single. I mean, Fat Beats was calling us every week to restock, restock, restock. Amoeba Records, Fat Beats LA, like London, like everybody was calling us to restock that. Black Alicious was doing well. Rubber Room was starting to make some noise. We are getting reorders and connected. Life was good. But what happened was Zero Hour was hemorrhaging. Mm. We were losing money. I say we because it's my cup. Three, two, one, yes. zero hour, right? The company I worked for that was paying my salary was hemorrhaging. 
And one day, Daniel Gloss and Doug Morris, Rising Tide, woke up and said, we're pulling the plug. Mm. No more funding. And it was terribly abrupt. Basically, my boss, Ray, came to us and said, we have to shut down this whole business. Damn. And I'm like, are you kidding me? I've got Black Alicious on the road right now. I've got Rubber Room finishing in the mixing lab about to master. We got, we're supposed to pay the mastering lab eight grand tomorrow to finish this album. I've got Scheme Team that we just repressed more vinyl and they're on the road and we've given them tours. I'm like, you can't do this. But there was no choice. Mm. And because I didn't own this label, because I was just the figurehead, I right. mean, should have owned it because it was my baby, but because I didn't have any control, and again, because I wasn't a good business person, we had to give up everything. Mm. Everything went to a head and everything was dissolved. Right. And it was so bad for me because it made me look like the bad guy because I was the only one they were really talking to. Sure. Black Alicious didn't have any communication with Zero Hour. I didn't have any commit. It was me all day long with all these well, bands. Well, you were finding all these... the groups. You were there. And I was their communication, yeah. but I was their publicist too. I mean, right. yes, we hired a staff. We had somebody doing retail. We did have somebody doing radio promotion. But it was still me right. on the daily. Yeah. yeah. And so I was suddenly the bad, the bad person. I was suddenly the one everyone was pointing fingers to. The mastering plants we owed money to, you know, other companies. The the label was uh, the bands were owed money. The lawyer fees, the legal fees. Uh. Oh, it was so bad, Peter. It was so so bad. Though I had a partner, so through actually no, that wasn't. Sorry, that, that was subverse. So we're still talking about three two one. It was just so bad. And at the time, I was talking to Big Just because at the time at three two one. I also tried to sign Company Flow, mm. right, because they were very impressed with what I was doing, sure. and it was right before Raucous was blowing up, right. and it was right after Raucous was kind of giving up on Company Flow, kind of, if you remember how they put out Fun Crusher, didn't really happen, then they re-released to put out Fun Crusher Plus, yes. but I think at that time it might not have been on Raucous, or they split an LP, there was beef, remember? So Big Joss had his eyes on me, and he was seeing what I was doing, he was loving my work, and he was thinking, so all this time... Big Just would come into my office all the time and I once just had a face to face and said, Just, shit is going down. We're about to lose everything. So lost my job, you know, had no money, mm. could barely pay my bills. I was getting death threats uh. from entourages of people. And right. Because yeah, because people were not only did we owe them money, but people they were oh they had to owe money because yeah. it was a shit it was terrible it was really really bad mm. so much so that it actually put me in the hospital i ended up having no. i ended up getting a tumor i i blame that because it was three months later massive tumor I had to go to hospital i was two weeks in hospital oh my god it was it was terrible and then i and then i recovered it took me six months to recover well i can only imagine the stress mm. level compounding to something it was of horrible that. Oh, absolutely horrible I'm sorry to hear that. so at the time thank goodness to big just from company flow we stayed in touch throughout the time that i was in hospital but right before i was in hospital there was a magazine called stress do you remember right. stress I do. Mm -hmm. and there was a one of the publishers of stress his name goes by ket alan ket okay he, he was also into the whole graffiti world and TC5 crew. Right. Um, Ket had heard what I was doing with 321. He was blown away. So he basically said, look, I can introduce you to another Wall Streeter because, by the way, Ray McKenzie, Zero Hour startup company, got his funds because he was in Wall Street. He was actually in Morgan Stanley banking oh, for many, many years, wow. which is how he was able to quit all that, put in his millions to start this label of his dreams because he was a rock musician playing guitar that never made it. So he was able to run a company and do this and be happy again because he was miserable on Wall Street. <laughs> so I'm talking to Ket, like, do I really want to go back with another Wall Streeter? This was a guy from Bear Stearns. Oh, my God. But I was like, you know what? Kind of desperate. Right. Because here's a guy that could actually pick up the pieces, pay off all the debts that Black Alicious needed to pay off, that Scheme Team needed, that Rubber Room needed, that Big Just could use. And we decided let's form this... Tri triage? What do you call it? A three? When you not a partnership, but a tri triage? I think so. Yeah. So we formed this partnership from Bear Stearns, Peter Lupoff, Big Joss. I made him my partner, nice. and okay. I and myself, and we called the company Subverse. Nice. And I believe Joss came up with the name Subverse. Right. So we were all three equal partners. And the funny thing is, people to this day still didn't realize that Subverse, I actually owned, co-owned. Right. It was my company. 
people don't a lot of people thought I was just the shouldn't say just but a lot of people thought I was just the publicist right just yeah. the face the promotional arm of Subverse so it was actually really an extension of where you were at absolutely at the, at the, at the, I was doing the all of the A&R at 321 right. and trying to do as much A&R as I could at Subverse although Big Just was very adamantly not allowing me to do A&R and kept me as that white chick that was great at PR and just do my job right. and basically let him handle A&R which oh my god Rogers years later because I could have had atmosphere. You know, it's stories like could have, would have, should have, and didn't happen. But hey, we got so, MF Doom, which is still you great, did. So. Which I'd love to talk about that too, because because you did um, not only did you basically you there was a re-release of Operation Doom. Well, right? or, or, listen, Bobito Garcia, we love you very much, Fondalem Records. But I wouldn't necessarily call it a re-release. Yeah, we we reissued it, we licensed it from right. from Bobito. Oh right. But I wouldn't necessarily call it a re-release because at that time, Bobita put it out, but there was no promotion. Nobody heard Operation Doomsday. KMD's Black Bosses was shelved, so nobody right. heard that either. There was no press. I mean, KCR Radio, obviously, Stretch and Bobito's sure. show was playing the hell out of it. But there was nobody from the source paying attention. There was nobody from Vibe. There was nobody from Rolling Stone. So, I mean, I'm, you know... Not taking credit away from Bobito, because that was amazing. Yes, what he was doing with Fondalem was incredible. But there was Absolutely. no promotion, and he knew that. Well, I think so, that was intentional with that label, too. Right, but it wasn't necessarily doing the artist a, a service, right. because, or maybe it was a disservice, because you're putting out these great records, but you can't do anything with these great records. So nobody could really discover them, because, again, it was pre-internet. It was pre, you know, we were just at the tales of the beginnings of Amazon, beginnings right. of CD Now. You know, we didn't have Pandora. We didn't have social media. We may have just started MySpace, but there was no real discovery right. at that point. It was still like sandbox automatic and exactly. hip-hop site hip -hop, and stuff like that. Exactly, hip-hop site. Of course, right. we did so much. God, we did so much business with those guys right. too, sure. So, so then what comes, what comes first? Was it Black Bastards or Operation Doomsday? How did that even come to you? Guys? Yeah, so I can't remember if it was Bobito who had both. I know we were dealing with Bobito, uh, and I don't know if that was because Ket introduced us, the guy right. from Stress, because I'm surely can't think that Peter Lupoff knew Bobito, or maybe he did. I knew Bobito because I used to listen to the show religiously, but I'd never actually met him. I'd always right. dreamed of meeting him, but we never actually met. So I can't remember how it happened... Oh, well, it was Juss. It was Big Juss. It must have been Big Juss because Company Flow was, you know, they were playing the heck out of Company Flow. Sure. So, yes, it must have been a Juss connection. Let's bring Bobito into this. Hey, Bobito's got MF Doom. I think we can license this and really put it out with our distribution arm, put some money into it and really make it happen. And I think with MF Doom, uh, what's his face? I can't even remember his real name now. What's uh, Doom's real name? Uh, what's his Daniel? Real yes, Daniel Dumoulin, exactly. Daniel said to us while we're in negotiations with Just and Peter Luboff, Daniel said, hey, I've got this uh, Black Bastards record that I'm dying to re-release because no one's really heard it. So we decided, hey, if you want, he basically said, listen, if you want Doom, you're going to have to take KMD. And we were like, well, that's a no-brainer. Right, that's Hell not such yeah. a bad thing. Right. So we didn't care. So yeah, that's what we got. So we paid a price. I mean, he wasn't he wasn't cheap, right? And you know, he shouldn't be cheap because he had the, one of the most skillful lyrical flows on the planet. So we knew that it was a gold mine that we'd be sitting on. But did I know how hugely it would take off? I hoped and dreamed. Sure. But to this day, I still smile about it because I really did put him on the map. Like I really single-handedly did really put him on the map. Because I'm the one that got him on the High Times compilation. I'm the one that got him all the gigs. Right. Because he didn't have a booking agent. I'm the one that got him all that amazing press. And when I mean amazing, I mean features and spreads and spin and Rolling Stone and, you know, alternative press and Request Magazine and New York Times and, D, you know, Washington Post and LA Weekly. I mean, so much press. They must have, you know, features in High Times. I mean, not a day went by. And then at that point, there was blogs starting to come into its own. And I was right. getting all kinds of blogs. XXL was doing well. Features in XXL. Features in The Source. I mean, it was just incredible. The, just the list goes on and on and on. Complex had just come up. We did stories in Complex. It was unbelievable. And we'd bring all these writers into this room. And sometimes, he, mainly, he would always, always do the interview with his metal face. Right. So you never actually got to see his face. And people would always ask me, so Fiona, did you ever see his face, like behind the mask? 
And funnily enough, yes, I did a few times. Not many times, right. but I did see his face behind the mask, yes. Yeah, I, I've, I've uh, you know, we did a record too as well with my label, which is, uh, you know, was a much more lower, uh, low-key situation. Yes, but yeah, there were some times in D&D studios mm-hmm. where, where, you know, it's not like, you know, the press is different, you mm-hmm. know, but in personal business stuff, yeah. But, I mean, undoubtedly, that's, that was the hallmark of that label, too, mm-hmm, of Subverse, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Like, oh, you say? God, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, we sold so many records. It put Subverse on the map immediately. Right. Um, so, with that said, I had done um, regional events with South by Southwest, with CMJ. I put together showcases to brand Subverse. Right. And we called it Subversive School. Mm. I think you might remember that component. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Subversive school. So we did a, and it was really just to brand Subverse, to further brand the artists on our roster, but also to give other regional acts a voice and a platform. So showcase so style showcase shows style, and clubs. Showcase style, exactly, in clubs, but usually at conferences. South right. by so I did my very first Subversive school show at South by Southwest. Before they were even doing it. What year would this be? Like 98 or something? Or 99? Or I think it was 98. 2000. Okay. 98. March 1998. Gotcha. Jaybird. I can't believe Jaybird's still with them. I mean, I can believe it. It was Jaybird, you know, Sadiq. I'll never forget this. We organized a panel. It was the first hip-hop panel for South by Southwest. Wow. And the first real hip-hop. I mean, they may have had other rap, Texas rap, you know, rap showcases. Sure. But as far as hip-hop, because there's a difference between rap and hip-hop. Right. This was the first, and this that was very local. This was the first time we were bringing actual regional and national acts that were hip hop to a showcase that's very indie rock for right. the most part. So people were like, "Whoa, trailblazing over here!" So we did this. Uh, I did this with a company called Hip Hop Mecca, hmm. which was a very small company at the time based in Austin that was trying to bring hip hop to South by. So when we formed this collective together, it suddenly became this successful endeavor where. We were really showcasing all these amazing artists that started exploding, exploding, and that South by Southwest was starting to get a hip hop reputation, which was great. So yes, yeah, so 1998, I picked, I handpicked Rubber Room, South, uh, Black Alicious, Atmosphere, People Under the Stairs, and oh my God, I wish I could remember this. I remember, I remember Benny DJ Benny B right. was DJing. And maybe it was The Arsonists, or maybe it was another New York group. I can't remember. I wish I could remember these things. But anyway, we did that showcase at South By, and it was packed. Word got out. People were going nuts. Every journalist and photographer and blogger, although we didn't really call them bloggers back then, were all in the house. And I knew we were witnessing history. I knew we were making history. And I think this was around the same time as Lyricist Lounge sure. was coming into their own, but they weren't going to South by Southwest yet or CMJ. In fact, I was the first people, first person to tell Danny Castro and Anthony Marshall that they should be coming to Mid M mm. and doing these shows at South by and CMJ. I think it was through me that they started. Well, doing I feel like those them. those things didn't ever initially. They didn't have much of a hip hop. Um, uh, presence or hip hop rather didn't have much of a presence well, at these they conferences. Did local, right? No, not at the conferences. Yeah. yeah, that's what I meant. But Lyricist Lounge was definitely doing their local. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. and it was very pivotal in New yes, York for right. sure, in New York City, but yes. not like in Austin, Texas yes. during South. And we Park. formed a lot of alliances. Lyricist Lounge and myself, so versus cool. school, we did a lot of promotions together. We also did a lot of stuff where they had 360 collage. Remember their collage projects before they actually called it Lyricist Lounge? Oh yeah, we actually yeah. did a lot of work together as well. Do you remember? We did the first show that was supposed to be Eminem's first show ever. We did a show in a small place uh, next to um, ah, what Electric Lady La- Electric Lady Studios right, yep. on um, Eighth Street. We hmm. there was a club there. I can't remember the name of it. It was did a lot of hip hop. Well, there was yeah, there was a place on the corner for sure that now is escaping my yeah. Memory. That's the place we did it, right. and we had Molly Mall DJ. It was Molly Mall, Benny B, uh, um, uh, Proof, rest in peace, mm. and this new kid Eminem. Wow. But Eminem couldn't show up that night because that was the night that Dre had discovered him and put him in the studio that night. Wow. So there's history there too. We have so many great stories like that. Eminem was on our flyer. We had the first Eminem show. Incredible. In New York. Wow. But yeah, back to Atmosphere. First South by Southwest shows with them, first panels with uh, Rhyme Sayers, and then first New York shows. I brought uh, Atmosphere to New York for CMJ. And I'll never forget, we did it at a place called Downtime, Downtime, Downtime New York, or Downtime. Mm, I don't know that one. Well, it, it went out of business a few right. years ago. This was in 1999, I think. 
Um, downtime, yeah. And there was a, it was in the mid, in Midtown, like on 8th Avenue and 42nd Street, right. 43rd Street, really seedy area. And we had lines down the block. It was mm. amazing. You did Slum Village's first show in New York, too? Or what was the story with that? Yeah, God, I can't, oh God, my memory. I did something with, yes, because I was doing things with, um, because I'd done a lot of stuff with Detroit. I'd done right. a lot of stuff with Proof. I'd done, you know, we were, we were talking to Eminem. We did something with the Athletic Mike League, which later became oh, yeah, Mayor, Mayor Hawthorne, Hawthorne yeah. who, by the way, is my cousin. No way, yes, really? Yes, Drew is my cousin. Interesting. In, by family, because my brother's wife, that's her family. So wow. by default, we're family hmm. too, yeah. Um, yes, Slum Village. Yes, I, I think it was like, I think I want to say it was their first, I did their first show at SOB's, yes. I did Fife's first solo show after they wow. broke up from after he left Tribe Called Quest. I did, um, oh, I did so many first shows for so many people. It, unfortunately, my memory, you know, so many years later, you, you Yeah, kinda, they start to stack up quite a yeah, bit too. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean... With, I mean, obviously, you were kind of doubling as both under these labels as the publicist and as the de facto booking agent mm-hmm. or show A&R, promoter. Just wearing, show promoter, right. right? Just wearing many hats. Like right. I was always used to wearing many hats. So then, entrepreneurial, right? That's yeah, what you do. and like like the labels before. You mean Subverse too had a had a shelf life of a certain amount of time too. Well, nine eleven happened. I mean, I don't even right. need to really go into details. No. We were we were right by the trade centers. I mean, you came to our That's office. right. We You're about, very. You true. know, we were in Greenwich Greenwich Street, Greenwich and Late, which is about ten blocks from the Twin Towers. And what happened was nine eleven happened, and um, this is two thousand one September. And my partner Big Joss, he freaked out. Like he literally thought it was Nostradamus. And he actually disappeared. He, we, we, he, we actually couldn't track him down for six, seven months. Wow. So here's my partner at a company. We're supposed to be doing business and have these artists on our label and working and marketing and shows. And he was gone. And unlike Zero Hour, which had more of a staff, and 321 had more of a staff, ours was very bare, minimal, bare bones. Right. You know, we had Peter Lupoff doing the, sort of the overall management, came from Bear Stearns. Administrative. It was me doing the promotional arm and the signing, along with Big Just. Big Just being the face and the in the studio, and then we had Op Operisha, Operisha Miller, Miller, Op Miller, yeah. who was our retail and promotion. He started oh. out with us. He's doing very well as a DJ now. Yeah. And, uh, I love vinyl, and then he also does marketing. Right. And I, I know him from Studio Distribution. He yeah, and then he was a Fader uh, Cornerstone for a long time. He's right. a great guy. I love love Op. We still stay in touch. Cool. Uh, and Op came actually through Peter because they knew each other. I think his Peter's son knew his Op's brother or something like that. Anyway, so yeah, nine eleven happened. Big just fled, and then I got really depressed, as we all did, being sure. here in New York at that time. And I just, my heart just wasn't in it anymore. And I, I just basically washed my hands of it. I woke up one day, and this is when we were using email. Obviously, I wrote Peter an email, like a two-page email. And just told her my heart's not in this anymore and that I can't do it. I'm done. Mm. And it, it was bad. I shouldn't have got out like that. I did. I left him in a hole. I left OP and him in a hole. But it was also 9-11 and people, you know, kind of know what's up then. It's very right. hard to stay, you know, focused and attentive. And there were other things I wanted to pursue at that point. Yeah. So then where did you go from there? I mean, did you, and you stayed in New York, obviously, as we said, but. It was a very difficult time for me because I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I knew I was going to stay in music somehow, but I was affected really badly. And in fact, I started getting asthma Hmm. and it was probably from going in a lot down there. Right. Because I I had asthma as a child very briefly and then I grew out of asthma and then it came back. Hmm. And I'm pretty sure it was because of being down in the area, you know, all too much. Right. Um, not because I smoke, because I people are like, well, you smoke cigarettes, don't you? Um, no, <laughs> this was asthma from other environmental, you know, deals. And so, with that said, I, I took a step back, and then I realized, well, I like talent buying. You know, I like kind of just discovering artists and doing cool things with that, and maybe getting in on festivals. So I found a girl that was just leaving uh, talent buying at uh, Joe's Pub. I heard that the position was open. And I had a lot of background at this point. Right. Right? I had all this hustle from Atlanta, from DJing to party promoting to you know being at EMI to being at Independence and being quite successful at Independence. You know, right. Zero Hour, 321 and Southwest. We sold a lot of records over those years, got a lot of great profile. 
that calls it successful, right? I was successful. So I was able to talk my way into anything, right? So although I had never really been a booker per se, other than my hand at doing bookings in Jerusalem, that was crazy. Mm -hmm. um, I was offered the job to be the talent buyer booker at uh, Public Theatre Joe's Pub. And it was fantastic. Incredible. So what year is this? This is like you took a year off or something? Or yeah, I or... took a... God, yeah. What, yeah. So 9-11 happened, right? So 2000, 2002. So wait, what happened in 2002 to 2004? Hold on. I know. Oh, 2002 to 2004. It's not like I took years off. It's more like I just kind of did the Fiona Bloom freelance. Right. And I got a lot of gigs from freelancing. Right. You know, I wasn't rich, but I would... People, I was the bomb. I mean, everybody thought I was a great publicist. I had a great you reputation are a great publicist. as a great publicist. Yeah. So getting work to do PR wasn't hard. So I was doing a lot of hip hop PR. I was known as that hip hop chick. And then I also started building out my international hip hop network. Started speaking at panels for international, and then still programmed international stages at CMJ, South by Southwest, A3C, Atlanta, right. stuff like that. Right. So definitely making a name for myself. Definitely making money here and there. But then it was in 2004. 2004, 2005 that I took the job at Joe's Pub and that was great and then the only reason why I left that was because I was at Mid-M one year and Steve Gottlieb who owned TVT Records right. I ran into him on the street uh, on the Croissette in uh, the south of France in Cannes and he was telling me somebody introduced us because I didn't know him I knew of him I love TVT he was telling me he was looking for somebody to do international marketing at his record company do I can I recommend anyone? So I was like, uh, me? <laughs> and he's like, well, what do you know about international? I'm like, are you kidding me? I go to Midem every year. I've been to Popcom. I've done licensing deals. I've done this. I've negotiated that. I know the right players here. I go there. And he's like, okay, let's do an interview. So came back to New York after Midem, saw him two weeks later in an interview, and they offered me the job. Mm. And I became the national, the director of international marketing for TVT. And my projects were Pitbull as he was coming up, Yin Yang Twins, and Little John. Wow. And it was great. I toured all, all over the world with those guys. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. So. And it was before Pitbull was anybody. Right. Because this is 2004, 2005. Pitbull was known through Yin Yang. Yin Yang put them, Little John was producing Yin Yang. Yin Yang put them on that United States of America, USA, United States right. of Atlanta. Right, record, right. Yes. Yeah. Which was that Whisper song and all that. And Pitbull had two songs on that that really blew up. So but they didn't even realize it was Pitbull back then. Nobody knew. Yeah, and so, but it is definitely a different, you know, arena for the style of hip hop that you had been coming from. <laughs> obviously, right? yes, it was booty shaking club trap. Uh, 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 what do you call it? Stripper music, stripper clubs. <laughs> right, right. It was strip clubs. So yeah, <laughs> we were, they were making music for strip clubs basically. So I went from the authentic, conscious. I hate the word conscious hip hop, but authentic right. indie hip hop. To strip rap, you know, to the rap strip uh, trap before we knew it was trap. Yeah, which is like a gigantic industry, you yes. know, in itself. Huge. So then, you know, taking all this into account, I mean, now, uh, you know, that was just another job for a few years too, and now yeah. it's like you're fully in your own thing. Now. Yeah, so well, just that tell was me. A, <laughs> I'm not very good with major companies. That job lasted about a year as well. Right. It was a tough place to be. I mean, listen, there was no secret to knowing that uh, Steve Gottlieb was a tyrant. I mean, it's on, everybody knows this. So he was just very hard to work with. He just, it was hard. Not, he wasn't the most amicable, nice person. And so the environment was always really bleak. Um, it was very high pressured. It was just not an enjoyable, pleasant place to be. Well, the higher you get up in certain that part of the industry, I think the more overbearing certain people can be. Yeah, know. yeah. But he was just exceptional altogether. Who knows? Really? But I mean, he was brilliant. I mean, look at all the great stuff that came out of there. Gil Scott Heron, Nine Inch Nails. I mean, there was incredible stuff. There. Right. Teacher Moses was even on that label. Which amazing. Teacher was amazing. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so that 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 was short lived. So basically, after. Um, after TBT, I had a very sh another short-lived job that was amazing. They were wiring ten grand a month into my bank account with this Swedish metal label that wanted me to sign rap music. Wow! Because they thought, oh well, she's over with Pitbull and Little John and Yin Yang, so she's the authority and knows everyone right. now. Which yes and no. So they, you know, I was able to talk uh, a good talk once again, the gift of gab, into them wiring me money, the Swedish label, and I would go out on the road and look for rat to sign <laughs> so that lasted about nine months and while I was doing that I was taking acting classes on the side because I was making so much money and 
great having these expensive bottles of wine, you know, taking care of boyfriends who were broke and I wasn't, and just, you know, being very generous with my money, which to this day I probably think I should never have done that because I would have had a nice, hefty bank account, <laughs> which I don't know. So. Well, you live and you learn, yeah. right? Yeah. So now what are you doing right now? I so- started an agency, a one-stop sort of full-service agency. It's the Bloom Effect. Yeah. And, you know, I just came up with that idea because of my name, Fiona Bloom, and everyone always says, you know, there's something about you we can't place our finger on. It's that effect that you have or that you give or create. And, you know, you always build. You're always building. You're always, you know, making artists and companies blossom. And that's your thing. That's your shtick. So it was just easy to be like Bloom Effect. Right. Bloom Effect. Who are you so, working with now? So, what yeah, are... and it's a, you know, it's a one-stop shop. It's a, international marketing, PR, social media, promotion, publicity, yeah, so I work, you know, since I've had a very colorful life. I right. was known as the hip-hop queen for many years. But I like to think of myself as having a broad palette from being the concert pianist that I was to having the jazz show right. to knowing all the rock in that Best of Britain show. And, you know, I, I just love music. And I've always said all year, all day long, that there's only two genres, good and bad. Mm. And I work with the good. So I am very fortunate to be working with incredible bands. I mean, one of them is a band from the 60s, British oh, invasion yes. called the Zombies. The Zombies, I saw that. That yeah. are really enjoying a really great uh, resurgence right now. They just put out a new album called Still Got That Hunger, which they very much do. And we're doing a finale of the most, you know, um, the most uh, definitely considered 100 records of all time, Odyssey and Oracle, doing a, a finale tour of Odyssey and Oracle next year, 2017. Wow. That's going to be epic. It's going to be a global tour with the existing original members. Amazing. So I've got the Zombies. I've got an Americana act who are amazing called Hollis Brown. They just toured with the uh, Rich Robinson of the Counting Cro- of the uh, Black Crows, and they just toured with the Counting Crows. Um, they're about to go to Europe for the next two months. They'll have a new album coming out soon. I've got a great R&B soul singer called Avery Sunshine, who's doing really well. I've got a funk band from New Orleans called Waterseed. I've got a Chicago... R&B singer called Nola Ade. I've got this legendary, iconic singer-songwriter who was married to Donna Summer for 30 years called Bruce Sedano, um, Timothy Bloom. So you, um, can work, you can work any kind of artist at this point yeah, in time, right? Yeah, I mean, listen, I've dabbled in everything but country and everything. I mean, I've, I love metal. I haven't actually worked a metal group per se, not yet. Uh, but I... I can work in anything. I can work in... I've done jazz. I grew up playing classical. I've done... Re- oh, I've got a reggae. Oh, do you remember the, the label G Street? I do. G Street just made a, is making a comeback with a label called G Jam. Oh, okay. And I just picked up their new production team called Destroy. All right. Um, and you're going to be hearing a lot about them. And the first single that's coming out is a Jamaican dance hall artist called Mystic. Gotcha. I'm in the dance hall reggae as well. And I just looked after recently a very famous reggae artist from Saint, Saint-Étienne, France, called Dub Inc. So, I mean, yeah, truly, I work with all genres. And yes. you're able to also, you know, work yourself, too. As a, a, You know, I see you have a certain level of visibility, too. I, li- I hope. I like to think, although the artist always comes first. Right. My clients come before I do. Absolutely, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Although I'd like it to be the same or the other way around, because one day I do have aspirations myself. I mean, I'm working on three books. They're in my nice. head right now. I haven't actually started physically writing them, but I've got great ideas for three books. I've also got my dream of doing an international, freestanding international hip hop festival, mm. and eventually would like to have my own school. Mm, nice, yeah. yeah. And I, I mean, I granted this is a little bit of a side road, but I mean, um, before I got here, I just like you know looked up your name and I saw this hilarious piece in the New York Post. Oh no, I didn't talk about that. No. <laughs> Can you, I mean, this no. is obviously, is that something that, how Dating did they even... sucks. Listen, I don't sleep. I have no time to socialize other than well, my you're socializing working all the my time. work and my artists and my Bloom Effect brand and, you know, what I live for and what I stand for. So actually socializing for my own personal reasons are very few and far between, but they really should come first because right. I don't want to wake up one day and be 70 and be alone and shriveling up and being like oh my god I never found that significant other or partner so I do want to start to make an effort but in the meantime it's very difficult to date it is it is it doesn't matter how beautiful how attractive how successful whatever it doesn't matter what you have it's still very difficult to to find that one to connect with somebody and there's so many options here and there's so many distractions and it's hard for me to connect because I'm a very I'm seen as this 
go-getter, somewhat aggressive, not not too aggressive, but you know, right. I say assertive, not aggressive. I come across as this independent, assertive, you know, fun, ebullient, you know, attractive, secure, confident woman, which a lot of men are extremely intimidated by. They really yeah, are. I don't get that. That's true, though. Yeah. So that makes it even harder. And then the fact that I hate online dating, and that's just whole, a whole disaster on its own. So, yeah. The New York Post article was terrible. I mean, it was... I, I, I thought, Was it something that you... Because it was hard for me to tell whether or not this was like... You are like, I'm going to put myself in this as a joke, just as a little bit of press for myself. <laughs> Or if it was like, if they somehow like nabbed you like it unwillingly. It wasn't unwilling, okay. I'm going to be very honest. It was definitely willing. I look at it as a little slapstick because I like to know, I like to think that comedy should be an important part of one's doctrine. Right. I mean, I'm a comic at heart. I love to make people laugh. Now, that's not to say I embellish. I'm a storyteller. Most of the stuff I use is fact, but I can exaggerate just a little bit. Right. But I have always been one to say and preach that press is better than no press, right? So hence doing this article. Oh, I could use the press, Fiona Bloom, the Bloom Effect. Of course, they didn't mention Bloom Effect, but they did call me a publicist in New York. Yes, that all helps the brand. It, it all is. Helps if the you Google search your the name, engine. then that for some reason that's up there at oh, the top, great. very tip top. Wonderful. So not any of the 25, 25 years of blood, sweat, and tears good deeds I've done but this one article that's, that's how sucks. they get you yeah. Peter that really sucks I'm gonna, okay. I mean for what well, it's worth can, for people that might not know yeah, might, do you mind if I fast. explain what sure, this go is ahead, so go ahead, go there's ahead. just it, I mean and it's more yeah. it's a tongue in cheek thing that's mm-hmm. not anything to be embarrassed about whatsoever it's actually quite it's funny quite funny and if you were to write a memoir or have a book or an act a one person show that's something worth <laughs> including yeah but yeah. there and I was just like I had a laugh reading it too because it seemed like uh, you know like it was you know, a comedic approach was yeah. was put into place yeah. there, but essentially, like you use Tinder to have a guy come over and put an air conditioner I did. in your I apartment, used a few of them and then you gave chores. me old heave ho. Yeah, that, yeah. Listen, I got a, a lot few of- chores. Yeah, not uh, different guys. Different guys doing different right. chores. Why not? That's amazing. That's hilarious. Work. I mean, make them feel useful and valuable. If they're not going to date me and get sex or have my company on dinners, then let them at least know that they. Made some kind of You know what? You might actually be onto something to create a completely separate app where it's just, um, you know, uh, do gooder guys that want to help people out, uh, help women out that need, maybe someone else needs an air conditioner. Yeah, I think there's a site. It's not quite the same, but it's called Rabbit Task or something. Oh, I'm not familiar with that. Yeah, something like that. But I mean, listen, I've always been about setting trends. So, hey, maybe I've set another trend here. Who knows? You might have. Well, listen, I appreciate your time and all the stories. Yeah, thank you so much. No, not at all. Thanks so much. All right. Bye. That was great. That was my talk with Fiona Bloom, the one and only. And I had a great time. I thought it was fun. She has an amazing story. Check out her company, The Bloom Effect. And while you're at it, look up. Me, <laughs> look up the house list. Uh, you can catch it on iTunes. Subscribe on iTunes and SoundCloud backslash the house list podcast. On Twitter, it's the house list pod. And if you want to advertise or have any ideas, write us an email at the house list podcast at gmail.com. My name is Peter Agosta. I produce this, um, edited and engineered by CJ Stewart. Opening music by Dame Funk and Keith E. Day. I really appreciate you guys coming and listening. Again, this is something I'm going to do once a week. And I hope you are into it. It's something that I love doing. All right, and I'll spare you any more rambling. Until next time, I'll catch you guys next week on The House List. Later, y'all.